Wow, that was the first time uh, we've had this meeting is being recorded. <laughs> That's cool. Hey, uh, welcome everybody. Um, as you guys are getting on here, as you know, it is Memorial Day weekend coming on. So I'm trying to represent and remember our fallen heroes. Hopefully you will take some time to do that and uh, thank those heroes that are still alive. So um, anyway, and, and the cool thing is, is I got to see my favorite hero two days ago, Mace Coleman, also an entrepreneur, former Fuller Brush salesman and CEO of uh, National Gypsum, but he went into World War II at age 15 as a Marine, fought in Okinawa, and he is such a such a cool guy, and I met him at the gym, believe it or not, a few years ago. So anyway, as you guys are getting on, um, one of the things that we're going to be talking about today, yeah, we'll go into ERTC, any other PPP questions that you may still have lingering out there, but what we want to do if, if it provides value to you guys is continue to offer up experts like Adam and Jack from a tax and legal standpoint, and I'm willing to jump in even from a coaching standpoint where I've done that since 1998, believe it or not, um, and working with CEOs. And uh, so this is kind of like open line Thursday. <laughs> so you guys can hit us with your best shot, um, hit us with the Q&A uh, with the questions and you can harass us in the chats. And so uh, Adam, I love your background. It's not a virtual background. It's a real background. <laughs> it looks good. Yeah. Oh, no. I'll manage. <laughs> uh, anything uh, that you've been seeing lately on ERTC or anything like that, that you think you want to hit on the front end of this? Yeah. So a couple more things that are just a, an addition to our meeting um, from uh, last week, our webinar from last week. Again, this is going down the thread of, you know, I don't qualify under the typical revenue reduction rules, which for 2020 was greater than 50%, for 2021 um, was greater than 20% um, gross receipts reduction. So this is a threat of, you know, government mandated shutdown. So, um, you know, for, first in meaning I didn't have that much of a revenue drop, but the government shut me down. Um, and you know, that's, that's like in Shawshank Redemption. Hey, the lawyer screwed me. Anyway, that was funny, Jack. Um, so down that, down that path, um, you know, firstly there, you know, there's still no further guidance, um, on how exactly to claim that you had a disruption due to government order shutdown beyond what we have. However, you know, I was on a webinar this week where the presenter went into, you know, a little bit more detail based on some, um, some seminars that the IRS has actually given on the topic and also some other precedents that have been established. So, you know, number one is, um, you know, like we said last week, you know, there's no rush. <laughs> Um, because, you know, you're subject to the IRS statute of limitations on when you can apply for the credit, which is typically three years after the filing date. The filing date is, is deemed for all of 2020 on these uh, payroll tax returns to be 4-15-2021. So you've got plenty of time to figure out what you want to do from a filing standpoint if you, if you believe that you might have a case to qualify. That's number one. Um, number two is that even though in all the IRS FAQ um, literature, it says, hey, th this is our interpretation as the IRS, you can't rely on this advice. <laughs> um, generally, when the IRS has done that in the past um, and something's been taken to the tax ta taken to court, if it's favorable to the taxpayer, it typically will stick. That's number one. Secondly, if the FAQ is not favorable to the taxpayer, but the IRS interpretation seems unreasonable, then they'll favor with the they'll favor with the taxpayer. So the point in saying all that is that, you know, tax courts have generally been taxpayer friendly when it comes to FAQs, which is completely different from revenue rulings, <laughs> you know, which is kind of a stated position. You know, we really thought hard about this. You know, FAQs are just, hey, you know, take your best shot. So that, that's a long way of saying that, look, you know, if, if you get aggressive on taking the credit, um, you know, 
pending nothing that says that you can't do it, like like we said previously, you know, we ought to go for it. It's just that, you know, there's no rush. Again, there, you know, no rush. Let's, you know, so unless you really need the cash. Um, so that's number two. Number three is, you know, your window of time in North Carolina, I think this is where I start to get concerned about the credit company, the tax credit companies that are out there. Remember, your window of time is when you had a government ordered shutdown. And for everybody's reminder, you know, unless you are an extremely specific business called an amusement park or a movie theater, you do not currently have a disruption in the state of North Carolina. You know, other than, you know, dining rooms and gyms are, or sorry, restaurants and gyms are still limited to 75% capacity indoors. Um, so that would still technically qualify under a government order. But, you know, pretty much for the rest of us, our government orders were short <laughs> from a timing standpoint, you know, and, 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 you know, maybe a little bit longer to get through phase two and phase three, but phase three ended in November of 2020, just as a reminder for everybody. So no matter what you're talking about, unless you're in niche industry, your window of time of government ordered, you know, whatever is from the first order, which was in March to the last order, um, to the lifting of the last order, which is in November of 2020. So that's your window of time. Now, if you, you know, the only exception to that, which I think is kind of a, man, this one would be dicey, is that if your supply chain was disrupted, meaning like you can't get part, you know, the example that they use in the FAQs is the auto manufacturer they can't get parts from suppliers because suppliers are shut down. I think the stretch would be due to government order, <laughs> you know, meaning like you, that probably would be the case that you would need to make versus, Hey, just the supply chain's tight for everybody right now. <laughs> um, so in that example, you know, I'm a manufacturer located in the state of North Carolina and I'm, you know, importing parts from New York that had tighter restrictions than we had in North Carolina. Therefore, my suppliers were shut down by their states. Um, shutdown orders, you know, there you go. I got it. That, that probably you got a good case for qualifying. If, on the other hand, your container ship is just sitting off port at the port of Los Angeles because there's a backup, you know, I guess you could say, well, because there was shelter in place orders in Los Angeles, um, then that's why the ports were closed. And therefore my container ship couldn't get in there to therefore give me my goods. Therefore I was disrupted. You can, I guess you can make that argument, but that's where we're talking about, you know, just let's be careful. <laughs> um on this because the irs has five years to come back and say no you didn't qualify you know pending pending our revisionist history <laughs> so you know just again we've got a long time to try to to, to, to establish this credit so that's the kind of argument you'd have to make is that you know california had a shutdown you know stuff couldn't come in on the port my stuff was sitting on a container ship that was waiting to come in like, it, I, I, I believe that there would have to be that kind of traceability for you to make the argument that even though North Carolina had lifted restrictions on me as a North Carolina manufacturer, I still was disrupted because my stuff is still sitting out in the ocean off the port of Los Angeles. Like, I'd have to have that kind of traceability, I think, to establish my claim that I had a disruption. So, um you know, that, that's really the second item to focus on with the employee retention tax credit. Um, number three is, <laughs> thanks, David. Number three is, this one's for you too. Um, the presenter of the webinar said, look, this is just his interpretation. This is not, you know, law anywhere, but he felt like owner wages um, could qualify. So, you know, there you go. That's contradictory to what we said last week. So, um, again, that's his interpretation uh, that was not spelled out with any clarity. It was more like it was just an omission <laughs> that existed. So, 
you know, some people interpret that as well since it was, it was omitted. And in other places, zoner wages are restricted. Don't use it. He was thinking, hey, since it's omitted, you know, his interpretation would be greater than 50% owners. It's going to be okay to include their wages in the calculation. So just another, another gray area. Um, then lastly, and this is interesting for the restaurant clients, um, the, you know, if you qualify for other credits on wages, which would be work opportunity tax credits, R&D credits, you know, things that are calculated off wage basis, you can't take that credit and the employee retention tax credit on the same dollar of wage. There was one omission, though, and that was the FICA tip credit, which applies to restaurants, which interestingly, you get the FICA tip credit by being a good, by being a good restaurant owner and saying that I'm going to have my employees claim their tips pay payroll taxes on those tips. <laughs> um, but you didn't actually pay the tip. Jack paid the tip. <laughs> and you could still get a damn credit and the FICA tip credit. <laughs> so, you know, just, you know, pending further guidance, um, you know, that's out there is kind of a double dip that, that appears to be legal as it stands now for the restaurant, for the restaurant industry. So um, that's, that's what I've got on the employee retention tax credit for this week, you know, same guidance as last week, you know, unless you're on live support from a cash flow. Per- oh yeah. Last thing is, um, you know, they, you know, due to, due to the backlog at the IRS, they also said, look, I mean, don't expect to actually get the cash back anytime soon. Everybody's waiting, you know, that's out there. So that's universal that it's not just you, it's everybody's waiting uh, to get money back. So, um, that's what we got on the employee retention uh, tax credit uh, for this week. Same guidance as last week. You know, the critical step number one, you know, that is time bound is your PPP round one loan forgiveness application. You just want to make sure that you've done that correctly to make sure that you're maximizing what you could get for the employee retention tax credit. If either you qualify due to the revenue reduction or you're going to go under the uh, government mandated shutdown um, route. And I guess the, um, the last thing that I just wanted to make sure that everybody was aware of too, um, and I promise I'll shut up after this, Gary, is that you get the credit even in the quarter that you resumed operations. So in um, 2020, for example, you know, you're down over 50%, that quarter qualifies, you know, And you get to keep on taking it until you're back to 80%. Well, if in the quarter that you're down 50, 50, over 50%, if the very next quarter you're down 15%, so I'm above 80, I still get it for that whole quarter. (laughs) So by default, you get two quarters, (laughs) um, which is great. It's a lot of money. So one, one question I've got on the point number three, where the, the, panelist was saying that the owner wages might qualify. Did they use in air quotes, Jack theory? He actually did. Um, <laughs> it was the first thing that I thought about. I'm like, Oh, he just did a Jack theory. I can't remember the presenter's <laughs> name, but like, what the other thing that I like too, is that his, his, he had a, he had a Jack trivia question, but it was um, ice cream. <laughs> like he would get homemade ice cream delivered to your house and his, can you guess where this picture was? I didn't know where it was, but it was actually uh, Wrightsville Beach. I thought, well, that's pretty cool. I mean, this guy's doing a national webinar. He's got a picture of Wrightsville Beach saying that's his favorite place on the planet. I'm like, I like Wrightsville Beach too. <laughs> <laughs> if anybody knows of a CPA firm for sale in Wilmington, we'd love to buy one. So I love Wrightsville Beach. <laughs> He's establishing commonality. It's a good thing. That's so right. Jack, besides the... Uh, Soft pretzel grilled cheese decadent sandwich at VVGB. What else do you have to talk to us about today? Man, you threw me under the bus so quickly. Gosh, yeah, that's pure carbs, uh, but it's so delicious. So a couple, uh, you know, real world experience uh, that, um, yeah, I end up paying a lot of tips because I'm usually the last one to leave because I just talk a lot at parties and stuff like that. So yeah, I know how that feels. Um, I didn't know that other people were getting credit for that. So I have to fix that. 
uh, a couple of numbers. So you focused on the ERTC, but back to the PPP, just to throw out some numbers. So as of Monday, 3.3 million loans, which is about $280 billion, um, uh, let's see, have been forgiven out of the total of 5.2 million loans issued. 1 billion in PPP loans were not forgiven, while 81.5 billion in loans are under review and applications for forgiveness have not been received for about $160 billion worth of loans. So just to give you a little bit of perspective um, and, and the fact that they're, they are running out of money, although some people say, well, we're kind of at the end. So if they haven't run out, maybe they're not gonna run out. But um, so there's that. And then I, I, I've seen various reports on this, but as far as the fraud, you know, every once in a while we talk about fraud on this program. And so I um, wanna give you an example of some of that stuff. So um, in an article I found as the first round of federal government relief program wound down last wound down Ritter Wheat Club in Dealey Nuts, which is a wheat farm and tree nut farm, each got the 20, 21,000 to 2833 for sole proprietors, proprietorships. Tomato Cramber got twelve thirteen thousand dollars and Seaweed Blyman got $20,000. None of these entities exist in New Jersey's business records and the owners of the homes at which they were purportedly located expressed surprise when contacted. One, one entity categorized as a cattle ranch, Beefy King, was registered in PPP records to the home address of this Joe Mancini, the mayor of Long Beach. And his comment was, and when I saw this, I was thinking of the, the Bare Naked Lady song, If I Had a Million Dollars because of of what it says so there's no farming here we're a sandbar for christ's sake so you know that line's like oh, for christ's sake so um yeah so he said he has no cows at his home just three dogs so yes fraught with fraud which is because of things like this uh we collectively are having a slowdown and slog of getting forgiveness on some of our loans and so i'm, I'm seeing that with our clients are like where's the money? Where's the money? Where's the money? Well, it's tied up in bureaucracy that was created in order to find these fraudulent people out and not give them money, which happened on, you know, with the first round of PPP. So, um, you know, again, could go through the numbers, but not really want to, um, unless you want me to. Um, but so that's really, oh, 2.5 billion left to make new loans as of the beginning of this week, which sounds like a lot of money, but in the scheme of things, not really. So um, that's where we're at on the numbers. So is this the case where kind of like what's happened and, and we have seen a, an uptick this year in fraudulent tax returns where somebody is using somebody else's social security number, filing a fraudulent tax return, getting the money deposited in their bank account instead of the one that has the real <laughs> social security number. Is that what happened with the guy or did he have three dogs that he fed that soft pretzel to that they became like cows? <laughs> uh, are, are you calling me a cow? I think you may have just no, insulted no. me. I'm not sure. <laughs> All right. Um, no. So this guy is just his address. So they called him up and said, Hey, what's up with this? And he's like, what are you talking about? And so, yeah, it was somebody who just had enough information, enough personal information about this guy, about the address to be able to submit it on the form in mm -hmm. order to get the money put into their bank accounts. And so they're getting found out as they're going through the, the validation and verification process. Now, um, you know, looking at, well, what about the bank? What's the bank's responsibility? I mean, should they not know more about their borrowers, even though it's going to be forgiven? So that's also an issue as, you know, for the, the bankers that are on the call or listen to the recording, know that, um, you know, it's even though the get out of jail free card is pretty extensive, it's not absolute. So you do have a minimal amount of duties. And so it's like, okay, did someone not go and pull up if they said they were a New Jersey entity, New Jersey, I believe you can, they have an electronic database like most states do. You go look it up and say, is it there or not? When was it formed? And they can't find it. They should say denied or at least look into it further. So 
you know, there is some responsibility on the banks to do a at least a little bit of due diligence, I would think, even if it's not stated that you have to do step one, step two, step three, and step two was go on to the state registration, find that if they are registered or not. But I mean, that's just kind of like common sense, I would think. So I don't think the get out of jail card for the, for the banks is that extensive. And so there's going to be some responsibility on the banks for that. One other question before we go into uh, a couple of the PPP questions that are teed up here. And that is, I, I heard this in the last uh, week from a couple um, business owners and uh, their, their concern was around um, liability on, uh, you know, with, sorry to use the term, but ambulance chasing litigators looking for money because of COVID infractions or somebody was injured, you know, or they got COVID because protocols weren't taken care of or whatever. Anything that you can talk about that, that you see coming down, Jack, from a legal perspective? I, I have not seen it actually happen, but it is inevitable where you create a class of victims that, and, you know, like, cancer producing drug or something, you know, you have, whether it's an official class action or not, um, it wouldn't be in this case, unless it is, you know, someone says, well, Bank of America did certain things. And so we're all going to sue Bank of America as a class action kind of thing. So, but it's, it, it is inevitable that there will be um, lawyers out there and others that are going to say, hey, you know, if you, if you've got taken advantage of call 1-800 blah 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 right and so and trying to to leverage off of that and um but it's like okay who who is who is going to be the defendant i mean is it um is it the your empl is it the employer is it the restaurant that serve the food i just think that there's, there's also a a level of proof of as to where did you get this you know um I don't know if you can hear the dogs fighting in the background. I'll get rid of them in a second. Um, they're not fighting; they're playing. Um, but they're captive in my office at home. So, um, but yes, I think that that's that will be inevitable. That that will happen, and then. But there's also, I think, an assertive movement that. Um, one second. Um, <laughs> that yeah, that. Uh, so state uh, legislatures, local governments that have the ability to put in regulations and, and basically give, I want to say waivers, but are, are able, are, are assertively combating preemptively, I think, some of these things as to, okay, if you do certain things, then you are immune because you've done as much as you can do within reason. You know, it's, it's unreasonable for you to spend thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars to make it super safe. Like, okay, an example would be is buy enough chemicals to wipe down um, the, the tables every five minutes, you know, okay. And even if someone's at the table to wipe around them and, you know, those kind of things. And that's a bizarre example, but so within reason. So there is movement on both sides, I think. But um, so yes, there will be COVID ambulance chasers. Yeah, I'm glad you're not that. Um, this question is from Bob. It's probably for you, Adam, but um, here's the question. Thanks for waiting, Bob. Um, I have one small business that did a second PPP loan that was funded on 2-22-2021. How soon can I apply for forgiveness on the second loan? Um, <laughs> as soon as your bank lets you. <laughs> I mean, that's the honest answer. It it, um, you know, it's going to have the same cover period as before, but it's going to be subject to the bank opening up portals to allow for it. So there's not really anything that you can do proactively other than to get your information together um, on it and be prepared for when the bank says, hey, you're ready to go or we're ready to go with our portals. I haven't heard of any banks being ready, by the way. Yeah, and I think the, 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 the default is on paper, as far as the SBA is concerned, is um, 10 months to apply for forgiveness, 10 months from the end of your covered period, um, as far as you not having to start paying. So I think that 
the application, you have to seek forgiveness before the end, before the loan maturity. But if you don't start paying within 10 months of recovered period, if you don't file the application for forgiveness within 10 months, then you have to start paying the, the bill on your, your loan is the way I understand it. Yeah, that's, that's true. And I just can't, bl- what I can't believe is that a bank would let that happen. So I think you're still subject to, they got to get the crap together on the round two um, application for forgiveness portals. All right. Next question is what's the appropriate way to track owner compensation payments for first law or first draw forgiveness? What's the appropriate, I mean, it should just be on their, you know, like you should have a wage report that shows what you paid that particular person, just like any employee and you just carve those out. Yeah. That, that does sound like a sole proprietor question. If that is not the case, let us know. And remember on the sole proprietors that they changed the rules such that that could be a, that could, that's a, that could be a function of your sales. All right. Um, feel free. The questions are free <laughs> and open. <laughs> Still free. Uh, let's see. There is something that I want to share uh, totally unrelated on a tangent and also ask you guys if, if you're aware of this, because I just became aware of it this morning in trying to have um, multiple EINs applied for on behalf of the same individual. So essentially special purpose entities, which is you get one per day as of a couple of days ago with the IRS. So if it's the same responsible person. So the individual that is a responsible person named on the EIN application, you only get one per day. I don't know how they're going to do that except with some sort of algorithm, but um, because I thought it was maybe the the person making the application. So I was like, okay, how many paralegals do I have to get together in order to apply for multiple units in one day? But have you guys heard anything about that on your end? Okay. All right. I, I think it, it comes from a reliable source on, on my end, which is a, a paralegal down in one of our Florida offices. So I think that is the case. Um, so anyway, just share that, that if you're in a transaction that um, you only get one per day, if you're, uh, so it's going to take, we have seven. So it's going to take a week for us to get EINs apparently. So uh, part of the chat, uh, David, thanks. He said, he wanted to agree with and amplify on Adam's earlier diatribe on the front end of this. It seems like a long run for a short slide. I like that, that line. <laughs> you got a big job to show the actual days on which you were impacted more than nominally and you paid wages. Any business that was truly impacted for more than a few days is going to qualify based on revenue decline. So my conclusion, forget the suspension of business rule. It's not worth it. So thanks for weighing in on that. Um, one of the things that I wanted to do, so this is, um, this is part of the click and clack, uh, but it is serious. <laughs> so Adam, I want to focus on stuff like you're really good at helping business owners save money and make money. <clears throat> Believe that or not, that does come from a CPA. <laughs> and, and Jack has already proven that he's really good at helping people stay out of trouble. And we, we love doing that too. That's part of, you know, like stay within the lines. And you heard that from Adam, like he'll be aggressive, but uh, you know, from a tax strategy, but you better be buttoned up. And so here's the question for you, Adam. There are, Many times that you answer the same question regarding whether it be owner fringe benefits or tax strategy, et cetera, what's the one question that you get the most frequent, uh, frequently asked and what's the answer? Yeah, you actually, you actually kind of hit it. So I'll, I'll, um, I'll give the one question and then I'll also offer the one piece of advice. Um, the one question is, what else can I deduct that I'm not deducting? <laughs> um, and the answer to that, if you kind of back into it, is that with the right set of facts, 
I can pretty well make a case for you can deduct just about anything that isn't specifically carved out in the tax code as you cannot deduct it. So, you know, good, good example of that would be, um, you know, carved out of the tax code, I can't deduct it, would be, you know, Jack's business suit. Like Jack cannot deduct his business suit and the associated dry cleaning by claiming that a suit is a uniform. I know, Jack, you're shocked. Yeah, well, I mean, that actually is in the tax code as an example of you cannot do that. And, you know, but how could Jack pull it off? Man, get some Shoemaker Luke, Shoemaker Luke swag. <laughs> you know, all of a sudden, Jack's got a uniform that's deductible. So, so I always tell people, you know, pretty much the clothes on your back with limited exceptions and your mortgage payment are the two things that I can't get away with deducting. Um, outside of that, you know, we've, we've got a lot of open windows, but that, that we could take care of, take care of some stuff. So I always look for, you know, let's do a pretty exhaustive review of owner fringe benefits. And I'll give you a good example of like, you know, everybody just, uh, you know, taking a defeatist attitude. Um, and it come it comes in the category of meals and entertainment. I mean, first off, you know, that's going to be a hundred percent deductible. Um, here, thanks to, I mean, that, you know, that was part of one of the relief packages is, hey, let's make Mills Entertainment 100% deductible. Um, and, you know, it really comes down to what's entertainment because everybody said, oh my gosh, you know, entertainment's not deductible anymore as part of the uh, American ta or tax, tax Cuts Jobs Recovery Act or whatever it was called um, that passed under the Trump administration. Well, ish, <laughs> you know, Entertainment is still deductible to the extent that it's in proximity of the business meeting you have. So what's not deductible is, you know what, Gary, you were awesome this year. I'm sending you on a cruise. Thank you very much. Not deductible. Gary, you know, the annual meeting this year is in Fort Myers, Florida. After we get done with the annual meeting, I've chartered a fishing boat to take us all out and go fishing. Deductible, because it was in proximity to the business meeting. So, you know, it's stuff like that where you just, okay, look, there's got to be a way. <laughs> you know, let's figure out the way. So, owner fringe benefits, I get asked, well, I get asked, what else can I deduct that I'm not deducting? And the answer is always owner fringe benefits. That's number one. I think the second thing, that I don't get asked enough. I mean, people really, um, this gets back more to the um, make more money, but, you know, a lot of times, you know, business owners get worried about the money that they made. And my response to that is, look, you need to continue to maximize EBITDA and taxable income. Like from your perspective, you need to make that as high as freaking possible because that's what drives company value and that dr what drives your own wealth creation. And that includes deducting as many owner fringe benefits as possible. You let me worry about the tax bill. <laughs> that's my job. You worry about how to make more money. So, you know, what I find is that, you know, people, people get kind of complacent or business owners sometimes get kind of complacent. And my response to that would be, look, if you add up your salary plus owner fringe benefits, plus distributions, and if that's not at least 20% of sales, you got to ask yourself, what are you doing? You know, like, what are you, what are you doing? Like, why, why can't you hit that number? Because if you kind of back into what's the average operating profit of publicly traded companies, you're pretty close to that. So it's like, look, I mean, if Duke Energy can do that with all of the executive compensation that they've got and everything else, why can't you get that number? Um, other than just not looking at the basics, you know, what's labor relative to sales? Is that trending up or down? What's my overhead relative to sales trending up or down? Am I constantly trying to make, you know, a half percent every year improvement on my gross profit, you know, either through price increases or better buying or more efficiency or whatever. But I, I just feel like business owners, you know, you had to, you know, set a bar, hit that bar, then continuously try to improve that bar until you reach the point of diminishing returns, which you know, for most companies probably is going to be in that 25 to 35% range, um, regardless of whether it's, 
you know, manufacturing, construction, or if it's professional services, um, that's kind of your ceiling, you know, unless you're like software as a service, you know, big tech type stuff. But, you know, I think just constantly continue to push yourself to set the bar um, and let me worry about how to manage the tax liability is a piece of advice that people should listen to more frequently. Love it. That's good. Jack, questions going to you. What's the number one question that you get hit with that would be kind of universal for how do we, you know, uh, stay out of trouble? And I know you do a lot of M&A stuff. So if you want to go in that path, that's cool too. Like how do I maximize the value of my company, et cetera? Sure. So, yeah, we didn't, we weren't previously provided the questions. So I know. As I'm th- as I'm th- which is fine. You know, I'm just, I just, I just want to, you know, make that clear because, because there's a lot, you know, I think uh, you know, as Adam's answering that question, there's probably a lot of things that are going through his mind and we could do, you know, many hours of, you know, don't do this kind of thing. So um, I would say for, for me, it's, I, I look at it, there's t- kind of two buckets. So starting on the, the M&A side, it's more of a, a succession planning kind of thing or a, here, here's the question. Hey, we formed this company in 1991. We signed the shareholders agreement that has a formula in it that when, and one of the owners wants out now, um, and it's, it's amicable mostly, or even if it's not. And, and the, the question is, well, the formula says, because, and, and it's, it's an interesting, it's chronology and growth of the business. So obviously in 1991, when these four fraternity brothers started this business, they didn't think about what it would be valued decades down the road when they inserted this formula, when they uh, have been paying themselves over the course of time, a lot of money with benefits, family health, company car, um, fuel being paid for, for personal trips, uh, because there's no distinction between the two of, two of those, uh, business or, or personal. And then it comes to a point where uh, there's a separation, a business divorce. And then they say, as I said, we have to pay him what? And you know, going through the formula. And then they tell me, yes, we've been doing all these things. They've been going to, to Vegas for that sales trip and the whole family has gone and they're staying for a week and going out on a chartered boat and that kind of thing. So um, what's up with that? And like, that's the deal that you struck back then. So I would say that, you know, as, as a proactive advice is, you know, always look at what your governance documents say and what the, the resulting implementation of those formulas are. So another example would be is that you have uh, key man life insurance or a buy sell policy and it has a certain dollar amount and as the value of the business grows and the insurance policy proceeds were meant to cover let's say 70 or 80 percent of that amount that needs to be paid by the the beneficiary the company to the beneficiaries of the decedent um of the shareholder who's died, right? And so, but now you have a funding issue because the value of the company, the value of that ownership is significantly higher. So now you have a gap more than intended between the amount of insurance proceeds and the amount that has to be paid to the beneficiaries of that shareholder's estate. So, you know, it creates a gap. So what I suggest to business owners is on an annual basis, when you're putting together your budget, your pro formas, take a look at those, those things too. And if things are changing and evolving over the course of time, that the compensation package, and I'm not talking about ordinary compensation, I'm talking about the end game as to what you get paid out needs to be modified and you know, look into those kind of things. The other is more operational, which is, hey, I have um, an employee who um, we don't like anymore or, and, uh, you know, for whatever reason. And as, as all of you know, there are variations of employment agreements. Uh, the default is, well, North Carolina is an at-will state, but you can turn a relationship to not at-will by creating with cause provisions in an agreement. So the more complicated ones, it's, they have four boxes. And 
two from the perspective of the employer, two from the perspective of the employee. From the employer, termination for cause, termination without cause. From the employee's perspective, termination, and we call it for good reason, which is really for cause, but we want to make sure we're not mixing up the definitions. And then termination or, or resignation um, you know, without cause, essentially, they, they quit. And what is the impact of those things? Uh, a lot of times the employment agreements don't address those scenarios. Um, they're more of a restrictive covenant that, you know, don't steal our stuff, don't steal our employees, don't go work for a competitor, those kind of things, restrictive covenants. And so um, what I find is, is that this is also an evolutionary thing with a company, which is a lot of companies on the front end, they're like, okay, we don't want to screw it up. We don't know what we're doing. So um, Mr. Lawyer, come, you know, make sure we're, we're doing this correctly. And then the next kind of point of evolution is, well, now they have our forms. So they're just substituting names in and out without really thinking about, well, that restrictive covenant was appropriate and enforceable under North Carolina law for that particular person in that particular position. But when you start trying to enforce something like that against a different person who has a different position, different duties, different geography, it may not be valid and it may completely invalidate the restrictive covenant, meaning it's as if it doesn't exist and that person can go open up a shop next door to you kind of thing. So that, that's an error. And then so what happens is once that happens, if somebody gets burned, then they come back to us and they're like, okay, there's more discipline within that. And then a, a, a micro issue or sub issue is uh, someone being an independent, an, a deemed an independent contractor versus employee. And so, hey, we're going to make them an independent contractor so that we don't have to deal with all the stuff that we have to deal with employees, including like unemployment and those other things, or withhold money from their paycheck as a trustee of the federal and state government to pull money for payroll tax, et cetera. So it's um, those kind of things that uh, on the operational side that uh, it, it's just evolutionary and is normal and typical, but I would suggest that you just be careful on those, the employment kind of things, because that's usually where I, I have um, in, in front of me at least three uh, terminations that the terminated party doesn't know is are going to occur, but it's like, okay, what do we do with respect to um, not only the termination, what obligations we have, but the fact that he has passwords, uh, keys, literally, figuratively, alarm codes and things like that. So it's a long-winded answer of saying on, on the operational side, it's, I see a lot of questions about employment type things and obviously other things, you know, contractual reviews and things like that. And then on the owner side, it's more of a succession thing and not realizing that um, the, the, the buyout has become significantly more rich and rich to the person leaving, expensive to the company that has to pay that. That's good. So in both cases, what I'm hearing in simplified Kansan language is an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. <laughs> yes. Just, you know, deal with stuff early and often <laughs> and appropriately until you've got your hair on fire. All right. Well, we had a pretty good crowd here today. Any other questions from the gallery? Feel free to um, let us know too. And if you don't have anything now, email me with, with thoughts, suggestions, and um, you know we may start moving in toward uh, some sort of a thematic um, weekly deal where we may have a topic that we want to throw out and then still go with general questions. Stump the Chump is always welcome. <laughs> These guys are good with impromptu. <laughs> so... <laughs> So on your car, on the 1985 <laughs> Honda, there was a little thing that there's a screw that you turn. <laughs> Jack, you're going to have to start practicing. Yeah, or you know what we should do? We should uh, play the, the Mercer Torme uh, scene where she's explaining how the transmission works and what the 1966 vehicle that's in that, you know, that oh, one I, wheel I thought you were going to say doesn't, so. Your biological clock. <laughs> Bio <laughs> <laughs> anyway. oh my. Any other questions out there?
we go. Have you heard of the tax credit for starting a new retirement account for empl employees? It's part of the CARES Act, I think. Yeah, that's, some, that's something that's been in place uh, for a while. Um, same thing on the health insurance side. So you, you, get, you get one. Um, I believe it's size restrict, like employer size restricted um, off the top of my head. Um, but there, there is one available. So I can't remember the amount. I think it might be 500 bucks or something like that. So if somebody knows what the amount is off the top of their head, um, chime in on the chat. Um, but there is a, there is tax credit available for that. Uh, what's it called? I heard 5,000, 500, 5,000. <laughs> yeah. Don't know definitively uh let's see it's not it's not it's i mean it may be capped at a, at a total of five thousand dollars but it's a per I believe it's a per employee credit mark thanks for the uh encouragement in the chat it says keep up the good work thanks for having these they're helpful well that's our hope and our goal and i know i have fun it's funny <laughs> the last couple of times that i've had vacations my wife's like seriously you're gonna do this i'm like honey it's fun i like it <laughs> so <laughs> she's been a good sport uh but i i really do have fun with you guys and i really have fun serving other people as long as we're providing providing value we'll keep doing it we're not good enough to go on to npr yet <laughs> you know she's just being polite when she says that she actually wants you to go do your own thing for a little while so she can have her own time on vacation yeah no la la <laughs> a couple of weeks ago she was not happy she was wanting to go into charleston earlier i'm like honey we'll be done by noon i know yes okay. absolutely <laughs> all right david thank you so much we appreciate you we'll see you next week too all right uh last call any questions hit us Thanks, Tim. Good to see you here, too. We appreciate you, too. All right. Last call. You got 10 seconds. Hey, Jack, while we're waiting on the last 10 seconds, you got a dad joke for us? Yes, I do. I was waiting <laughs> for you to ask. No. Um, okay. What is the smartest mountain? I have no idea. Adam, you can throw in a guess? No. Mount Cleverest. Oh, oh awesome. man, the groans. Oh, my goodness. I don't make them it's up. I just tell them. <laughs> That's awful. <laughs> that, is, that is bad. <laughs> All right. Well, I hope everybody has a wonderful Memorial Day weekend. Remember those that have paid the ultimate sacrifice to defend freedom for us. And uh, we appreciate each and every one of you, uh, especially you business owners that make it happen every day. So we appreciate you. We will put this up on the BGW YouTube channel later on this afternoon, thanks to the help of Rachel Coftry. Talk to you later, guys. Have a wonderful day. Thank you. Have a great holiday. Bye-bye.